Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our seminar. Hopefully everybody is getting joined and enjoying this Friday afternoon. My name is Andrea Torres. I am a classified uh, professional, just like you all here today. And I also serve on the Classified Professional Development Committee. These seminars are part of a joint effort between your fellow Classified Senate um, and professionals, the Student Equity Office, and Fresno City College faculty. And we're here to demonstrate a commitment to anti-racism and improve the communications between staff, faculty, students, and administrators. Just a reminder, these sessions are being recorded and will be posted to the FCC Professional Development YouTube page, along with all of our other previous seminars in this series. So if your colleagues aren't able to join us today or you want to rewatch any of these sessions, they will be there for your enjoyment. If you have questions throughout this presentation, you can ask them by using the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen in the attendee hub. These can be anonymous, but we want to encourage you to use this time and this space to be able to ask questions throughout this presentation. Take advantage of the resources and the presenters that are here today for you. Today, we're, we are joined by John Cho and Michael Takeda. Both are full-time faculty here at Fresno City College. John teaches Asian American Studies, and he will be retiring this uh, semester after more than 20 years of service. And as the only full-time faculty in his discipline for a while, he has grown the program from a single course to six courses and an AA degree. So we wanna thank John for his service and also um, congratulate him on his retirement. He's also developed the Asian American Month and Asian Fest activities um, that we have become with uh, so familiar with over these years. And this is actually happening tomorrow, Saturday, April 30th. So take advantage of uh, visiting that as well. We also have Michael Takeda, who is a reading instructor here at Fresno City College in the Humanities Division. So he's finishing up his tenure um, activities in the Academic Senate as the Academic Senate President. And him and John have worked together on previous activities, such as the Asians in the City Project and Student Film Festival. So today they are here to present to you on the topic of anti-Asian violence, a window into the past, present, and future. John, I will turn it over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Andrea. Um, so in collaboration with uh, Michael, uh, I put together kind of like a PowerPoint slide. So I wanted to make it uh, a little bit interactive uh, between the two of us. So I was gonna ask uh, uh, Michael to read some of the slides. Uh, I'll add additional comments and I put a question on each slide. So I wanna direct that to, to Michael as well. So on, on this first slide, uh, anti-Asian violence, a window into the past, present, and future. Um, Michael, uh, talk about uh, what you see in the, the graphics or the pictures. Uh, what do you think they're about? Um, well, from what I'm seeing here, these are, are uh, some very pivotal moments uh, in the, the, the history both of anti-Asian violence um, uh, but then also a little bit of, uh, of advocacy. Um, you know, when I, when I, I look at that top left picture, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on, on one hand, right. It's surprising because, um, when you see images, uh, of lynching and you see images of hanging, um, it's often associated, uh, with, uh, with, Black Americans with African Americans, but not not so much with with Chinese Americans. But um, you know, as many as many in this audience will will uh, probably already know, but the history of uh, anti Chinese activity and anti Chinese sentiment in the U.S. goes back a really, really, really long time. Um, and then moving through history, just all these uh, you know all these uh, different moments against all of these different groups. Um, see some pictures of the rioting. Uh, you know, on the bottom right, uh, but this was, I, I think that, that, that poor family that was attacked at a Sam's club, um, more re the, the most recently, but, but as you move through time, you see all these, uh, all these different, um, periods and all these different examples of, uh, of anti-Asian sentiment. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michael. So you hit upon one of the earliest 
uh, graphics and one of the latest ones that happened last year. Uh, so I can just start. Uh, next slide, please, Andrea. Uh, go ahead, Michael. You could read and the last question. Or, well, this one I have a question, but I'll comment. Uh, go ahead. Uh, right. So um, what we have here is a list of, uh, of definitions, um, but then also some really, really, really important concepts um, when, when we think about where a lot of this sort of anti uh, Asian sentiment comes from. So uh, the first one, right, is just uh, this idea of violence. Right? So violence is the physical force used to injure or kill. Uh, in law, this could be labeled an assault with a threat to do physical harm. Anti-Asian means that the assault is targeted at victims primarily because of their perception as being Asian. Asians uh, are to be blamed. They caused the problem. All Asians are lumped under one all-encompassing category of being Asian. Asians are the model minority. Asians are the perpetual foreigner or should go back to Asia. Asians won't fight back. And finally, Asians will accept verbal or physical abuse. OK. So when I was uh, putting together this uh, presentation, uh, I tried to look at uh, different incidents from the past and more recent time as well. And these were kind of like themes that uh, uh, came to me. Uh, when people uh, do acts of violence on, on Asian people, uh, primarily is because they are Asian. It's not that they know uh, their targets or so forth. Uh, the one about the encompassing category of being Asian, uh, I'll bring that up on the, the more recent cases, uh, Vincent Chin and so forth. Uh, most people have heard of uh, the model minority uh, we refer to as a myth uh, not being true. Uh, if you're not familiar with the model minority, uh, it starts back into the, the civil rights era in, in the 1960s that uh, Asians are, are the good minority. Uh, they're quiet. They're not going to rock the boat, uh, create waves type of thing. Uh, the ones that uh, sticks out for a lot of people would be the perpetual foreigner. Uh, you could be here multiple generations. People assume or connect you with an Asian country. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, go ahead, Michael. LA riots of 1871. Oh, I thought you were going to talk about these. Oh, you want me to read it? Yeah. So I wanted to make it a little interactive. So you read it. I'll talk about it, and I'm going to direct the question to you. <laughs> so I put the slide together, <laughs> so you need to do more presentation. <laughs> okay, LA riots of 1871. So um, there first was a fight between uh, two Chinese tongs, and again, tongs uh, is is the term for uh, criminal organizations, uh, or it really like. You can think of those as kind of like Chinese gangs. Um, and I guess what happened is they, they, they caused the death of a, of a policeman uh, and a citizen, uh, which, which then led to uh, a mob of uh, 500 men uh, to really target, uh, to target the, the Chinese and get revenge. Uh, in the end, 19 Chinese immigrants were killed, uh, and then 15 were subsequently uh, hanged uh, and Lynch uh, after uh, after they were already dead. So 10 men were prosecuted and eight were convicted, uh, the, but the convictions uh, were overturned on appeal uh, from the, the, the newspaper, uh, the Austin American Statesman, uh, from U.S. Representative uh, Chip Roy. Um, well, the, the picture's kind of covering it up, but uh, But John, what does it say in in D? Uh, Did you the one that wrote that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. Oh, sorry for that. Uh, I think he almost kind of like praised uh, the idea of lynching. 
you know, kind of like justice type type of thing. Uh, so it's kind of like that, like Texas justice or Texan justice. Okay. Uh, so Michael, I have a question. Why would the mob hang these men after they were dead already? They're dead already. I mean, so I, I don't know the, 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 the correct answer to this question, but I can guess. Uh, and, you know, my guess is just uh, is just so that they would kind of serve as an example um, of what happens when, uh, you know, to to Chinese um, when I guess they get out of line or uh, when they do something that uh, that there's some disagreement about. So just kind of to serve as an example. Okay. Uh, that would be one example. Uh, how I look at it uh, is that we really hate you. We really despise you. You're dead already. Uh, what can we really do to you? Uh, so for me, it's more symbolic. Uh, you deserve something even after you're dead. Uh, this is our country. The lynching is to punish the bad people. Uh, you're the bad people. That's how I interpret it. So more than example, because it's kind of like you kill somebody, I'm going to kick him even after he's dead. That's how I interpret it. Next slide. So uh, I want to just add one more uh, one more thing to that, and you know, very related to um, related to the you know the LA riots and the subsequent hanging. Um, you know, there are there are examples of uh, also of the Chinese here in Fresno, right? So I mean, just to bring it back to a, you know a really local context for us here. Um, Right there, there are there are stories and examples uh, from you know around that time with from Chinese immigrants here uh, in the Fresno area. And right again, when when we think a lot about redlining and we think when we think a lot about um, uh, about the you know the inability of of people to buy homes and to live in certain areas, um, it, it very much affected uh, the Chinese as well. Uh, and so you know if if any of you know where where Fresno Chinatown is, um, right? There are examples from history of, of Chinese being chased, right? From the east side of the, of the railroad tracks, right? Everybody knows where those tracks are, literally, right? To the, you know, that, that sort of metaphorical or the euphemistic, right? The other side of the tracks, right? Because the other side of the tracks um, in downtown Fresno, and, and again, where Fresno Chinatown is, is the only part of, uh, of Fresno where Chinese were allowed to live. It's the only place um, that that uh, the people in Fresno would allow uh, Chinese people to live at that time. And, and when they weren't in their in in the area where they were supposed to be, uh, they would be chased. They would be shot at. Um, they would be beaten uh, until they uh, they went back to to the Fresno Chinatown where uh, where they were allowed. Right, quote unquote, allowed to live. Okay. Uh, go ahead. So again, I mean, uh, moving moving on, right? We have, I mean, you can, you all probably were reading this while I was talking, but um, right, all along the West Coast, obviously, we see uh, examples of uh, these these different cases of uh, violence uh, against Asians. Right here, being the Snake River massacre. Um, uh, in Oregon in 1887, right? So we have the case of 34 uh, Chinese gold miners uh, being being attacked, being robbed. Um, Robert McMillan, who was 15, 16 years old, uh, in his deathbed confession, uh, said that five members of the gang uh, killed 21 uh, Chinese uh, Chinese miners at one uh, of the camps and then threw their bodies into the river uh, and then took a boat to the next camp and killed 13 more. Uh, but uh, George S. Craig right, defended it saying no one in the jury knew the Chinaman or cared much about it. So they turned uh, the men, including Robert uh, McMillan, loose. Um, so there are now uh, 
memorials in 2015, right? I mean, uh, how many years later, right? Uh, 133 years later, um, to, to document uh, and memorialize that event. So uh, how do you answer the question? Why was everyone shot up, shot, cut up and stripped and thrown in the river? What's your thought on that? You know, similarly to to the explanation for the last one, um, they just weren't the Chinese weren't weren't seen as being human. They weren't seen as being uh, as as being fellow human beings, or at least on the same level uh, as the men who killed them. Um, right, which is the only way that you can uh, that you can treat someone like this. Uh, Michael, on, on your response, I agree with you 100%. That basically, if you say less than human or subhuman, uh, that fits in with uh, the, the jury. Uh, hey, uh, they're not regular people like us, so what's the big deal? What's the difference if there's 10 Chinamen dead or 50 or so forth? So, I, uh, we see. We see identically on this one. So, next slide. Andrea. Watson Bill Wright. Uh, before we go into this, uh, look at the pictures. Uh, what stands out to you? Uh, the picture on the top right, uh, everybody's nicely dressed, uh, Filipino men, uh, their dates, uh, white women. Uh, you see a couple uh, in the middle, and then uh, the Filipino headline, the Filipino newspaper. Uh, go ahead, Michael. So the Watsonville riots, um, and again, you know, this is it, it's a very interesting case uh, because uh, even you know here in the Central Valley, obviously Watsonville. Um, it's not necessarily part of the Central Valley, but not far away. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the pieces of the, this history of of labor movements, uh, especially you know farm movements um, uh, here in Central California, right? Is it was it was uh, there were a lot of Filipinos that were a very big part of that movement, right? You think about Cesar Chavez, um, Filipinos were right there next to him. Right, so it, oftentimes, right, it's 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 the, that movement, that farm labor movement, is is associated with um, uh, with you know Latinx Americans, but but very much uh, the Filipinos uh, were, were there as well. So we see this case from 1930, um, and you know, seeing that picture, it's amazing, right? Because that picture from then, it was you you see this this right uh, in item B here by right, talking about that mixing uh, with with white women, right, which obviously in 1930 um, was not something that was very accepted. Um, and so right, these these pictures then show a very stark contrast then with that 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 uh, headline on the bottom. Uh, as it says here, the riot lasted for four days. Uh, when and when the mob beat 200 uh, Filipino men, destroyed a Filipino dance hall, and ended up killing uh, one of the men who was hiding in a closet somewhere. Uh, said the judge, little brown men strutting like a peacock to attract the attention of young American and Mexican girls, uh, 10 years removed from the jungle. So one of those, uh, in one of those cases, uh, this man, Salvador Roldan, uh, circumvented California law and interracial marriage between whites uh, and Negroes, mulattoes, or uh, Mongolian. Okay. Uh, be before I go into the question, uh, let me explain part of the things. Um, so, common theme for a conflict between Asians and, say, whites or white Americans is economic competition. Uh, Chinese started coming in the 1850s, 
Japanese, 1880s, and so forth. But it's really with uh, the Filipinos that there was more mixing with white women. And primarily that is because the Philippines became American territory in 1898. And so as America uh, became the, the colonizers in the Philippines, uh, they brought in the uh, American uh, government rule, uh, but also teaching of English. And so the Filipinos that came over uh, knew English. And I think that uh, allowed them to, to mix with the white woman more readily. Um, my comment on Judge Rohrbach is his hatred towards the Filipinos is really fueled by the, the mixing of the Filipino men and the white women. Uh, I tell my classes uh, today or, you know, last few years, if a judge uh, said this uh, in court, he would probably be disbarred today. It's basically saying like, Michael, if I was Judge Rohrbach and you showed up and I says, I hate people like Michael Takeda, they would remove you from the case. I wouldn't be a judge anymore. But I tell the students, hey, this was 90 years ago. He's not going to be removed. Okay. Uh, on the Salvador Redon case, what happened was uh, Salvador Redon, uh, he married uh, basically a white English woman. Uh, he said, I'm none of the above. I'm not a Negro person. I'm not mulatto. I'm not Mongolian. I don't think there were any Mongolians. Uh, they're primarily referring to East Asians. Uh, so he said, I'm Malayan or, you know, and so they added that in. Okay. Uh, this is a very easy question, Michael. Why the anger? Well, I mean, the, the, the anger is a lot of what uh, you were already talking about, right? I mean, you think about what George, judge, the judge said, right, in the case, uh, this sort of interracial uh, relationships or this uh, interracial uh, mixing, uh, interracial dating. Um, but it's, it's, it's been fascinating, you know, throughout time when we think about uh, these kinds of cases where, right, that, that idea of economic competition, right, which, which you know, takes, takes the, the form of, right, they're, they're coming for our jobs, right, they're taking our jobs, uh, they're coming for, uh, for, for what we have, they're coming for, uh, you know, our hospitals, they're coming for this or they're coming for that, right, it's, it, it's, it's interesting, right, when you see this throughout history, right, because we've all heard that, right? I mean, how many times have we heard, right, oh, X people are coming for our jobs, X people are coming for our things. Um, and it's, it's all it is, is it's just this rehashed, uh, this rehashed sort of trope that's used against any group um, that, that is seen as, uh, as infringing in some way on, on what, what belongs to uh the the dominant white culture yeah um and, and then right like it does now with you know build the wall or whatever you want to think about um it, it fires it's it's used as a way to fire people up yeah uh this one i i think is more than economics to me it's really the idea that uh these are our women and you can't take any of them, you know. Um, so it, it's it's kind of like it's hatred fueled by by that. Uh, I'm thinking about the Ahmad Arbery case and the the defendants, two or three of the defendants, and it, it seemed like uh, one of the daughters or sisters of one of the defendants, uh, uh, quite racist. Uh, uh, she was dating or girlfriend with an uh, African American man, and and so it's 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 almost kind of like there's anger or hatred, but it's not because of work type of thing. Although work is going to play, so I I basically feel it as uh, these are our women. Uh, keep your hands off type of thing. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, this one this one I talk about. 
in my classes all the time. So good, Michael. <laughs> I have a lot more to add after you finish out. Right, right. So again, you know, the the, the Vincent Chin case, and, and it could just be because it's it's you know a little bit more recent. Um, uh, the the Vincent Chin case is one that I I, I think a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, more and more people are familiar with now. Um, uh, now that you know we we there, we've seen a lot of this anti Asian um, uh, anti Asian violence, uh, but also this this sort of racial reckoning that we've had uh, in the last sort of year and a half. Uh, more and more people are becoming aware of uh, this this Vincent Chin case, um, and right Vincent Chin right it, it is an example then of someone who um, right, being Chinese was because, because he's just Asian, right? And the, the two defendants, right, were, were unemployed, fired from their jobs um, because of the competition with the Japanese automakers, right? Vincent Chin, just being Asian, right, stood in for everything that those men were angry about, which, and which, which was the Japanese, uh, and and they took it out on Vincent Chin, um, and they killed him. Um, and then you know when when in the aftermath of that, um, the the men were basically just given a slap on the wrist, and and this really 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 uh, fired up uh, the the Asian American community. Uh, so this is you know this was one of those. Uh, moments that um, that we can look back and see where the the Asian American community really stood up and advocated and um, and got together and protested. Okay. Uh, do you think race played in this case? And then I want to add more to what you said. Just simply. So I would say ethnicity more than race, but yes, I mean, it, it was, Vincent Chin was Asian. Uh, these guys were angry at the Japanese. And for, for a lot of Americans, there's no difference between a Chinese person and a Japanese person, right? So, but, but yes, I mean, I, I definitely think, you know, exactly. he played a big okay. role. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, I think, uh, this case, um, I I can remember back about it uh, because uh, when I found out about it, it is I I think I was working at my parents' restaurant and I first heard about the case uh, from uh, East West uh, a newspaper uh, out of San Francisco. So they had like articles in English and articles in Chinese. Okay, uh, how to hear about the case? Uh, well. What happened with, with the case was, let me add into it. Um, the two men killed Vincent Chin. One man held him, the other one swung the bat. Okay. So the two men, uh, Ron Evans and Michael Nitt, they plea bargained in the case. And so the judge decided uh, $3,000 fine and probation. Uh, well, this is kind of like uh, before we hear the term hate crime. And so the Asian community was outraged. Uh, the thought that came to my mind when I learned about it is like there's a headline on a newspaper. And the headline says, Asian life is cheap. All well, your life is worth $3,000. Pay the fine, nothing else. So the federal government got involved and they tried the case again, but you know, double jeopardy, uh, the men had plea bargained, uh, you know, they got a sentence. So they plea bargained not on being a hate crime, saying uh, that racial animus was involved. They were motivated by hatred, okay, uh, for his race. Um, Michael already said it. Uh, is there a difference between Japanese or Chinese? 
I think in the killer's mind, in other people, they're not going to make a distinction. Whether you're Japanese, Chinese, Hmong, Filipino, you're the same. There's no difference. Okay, did race play in the case? Uh, I think it played in the case in multiple ways. Would two men had confronted Vincent Chen if he wasn't Asian? Would they have said something, you know, if he was Latino, African American? Maybe not, but they were angry. If they lost their job, uh, the Japanese car companies are selling cars. It's those Asians. There's no distinction. Uh, the judge in the case said, these men are not criminals. If it was a brutal murder, they would be in jail. The question or thought that I have in my mind, hey, judge, if somebody killed your son with a baseball bat or somebody else held him, would that have been a brutal murder? All of us know that if it's one of our own, that would have been a brutal murder. Again, you know, did race play in? I think so. Uh, think about the model minority. Asian Americans are basically quiet and so this galvanized people you see in the picture. And the reason it galvanized people was that they're thinking, hey, we've been quiet. We work hard. Things will come your way. How much is our life worth? $3,000. Maybe back then, cost for a used car. You're not worth much. So I think this case really made Asians to reflect, to think about themselves. Who are we in America? How did it change the auto industry? You could buy a car made by Toyota. It might be made in America. Okay. So yes, I think race played in this case big time. Next slide, please. Go ahead, Michael. So as we, you know, move uh, move closer and closer to to our current day, um, right? I mean, I think that this is this is uh, something that many of us remember, uh, probably very vividly and firsthand uh, from our, our own experience. Uh, maybe you know, either on television, um, you know, watching watching these riots happen. But um, the, you know, the, obviously it stemmed from the, the white police officers uh, beating Rodney King. But over the course of, of, um, uh, of the riots, right, there was, and, and there had already been a lot of tension um, for a variety of reasons uh, between the, the Korean uh, American community and the African American community um, in, in certain parts of uh, Southern California. Um, the, well, Mr. Cho can talk a little bit about the, the case of Sunju, uh, Sun Jadu and Latasha Harlan's, uh, which was again, uh, one of these, one of these cases that, that really stoked, um, this fire stoked this rift between, uh, between those two groups. Mr. Cho. Anything else? No, I mean, that's, that's it. I, I figure everyone can, you know, can can read what's on there, but. Okay, uh, okay, you know. okay. Um, so if I comment on, on this, uh, a lot of people from uh, South Korea, they came in uh, very different from the Filipinos. Uh, they didn't have much English skills. And so if they had money, uh, let's say they were doctors or stockbrokers, uh, they brought money into America. They purchased businesses. And a lot of businesses were in lower income neighborhoods in, in LA. Uh, the case of Sun Jadu and Latasha Harlings, Latasha Harlings was a, a teenager. And she put a 
orange juice uh, in her backpack. Uh, Shinjadu thought she was going to steal it, so they grab, and so she gets knocked down. Shinjadu pulls out a gun and shot the Tarsha in the back of the head. So this is going to create a lot of tension in L.A. But it's really the acquittal uh, sentencing or decision in the Rodney King case that sets everything off in L.A. Uh, the news wanted to really play it up as kind of like a Korean and African-American conflict. But if you look at the numbers arrested, it was very mixed. 40% uh, were black African-Americans, 40% uh, were Hispanic, and the other 20% were white and Asian people. They got into looping. Uh, most of the damages to the Koreans, uh, the Cambodians, because they're riding in Long Beach. Okay. Uh, one year later, uh, one third of Korean stores reopened. So the question for you, Michael, imagine your family had a store that was pretty heavily damaged. Would you have reopened? Yes or no, or why not? I mean, it's a, it's a really tough one. I mean, when in, in thinking about this, I mean, you really have to put yourself in the position of, uh, of these people, you know, to, to Mr. Cho's point, right, John, to your point, um, you know, so many of these Koreans and, and many of these Koreans, you know, that, that came over were very, very, very well educated. Um, you know, they were doctors and lawyers and, and they held very, uh, very high positions and they, they were very well educated in Korea. Um, and they took everything they had. They they moved to to the U.S. Um, for a, uh, for a better future. Again, um, you know, I think I think one thing that 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 many of us think with modern day South Korea, right? Because modern day South Korea is a very is, is a very has a very thriving economy, right? But just right half a century ago, South Korea was a third world country. Right? It was one of the poorest countries. Um, and so, anyway, you have a lot. You have this big movement of um, very well-educated South Koreans uh, migrating to the uh, to the United States, and they put everything they had into these stores. Right. So, I mean, on one hand, right, if I think about it from my own context, right, if I opened a store and it was destroyed, I would not open a reopen a store in, in particularly in that same neighborhood. Right. I, I, I think for me, it might it might break um, it might break my 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 faith it might break my trust. Um, but, you know, for for many Koreans who staked everything they had into these uh, into these stores. Right. Not reopening a store. It's kind of like giving up. Right? It's kind of like giving in. And so. Um, it's a very different mindset to have when you're those Korean immigrants uh, that were coming and and using that store right as a, as a way into um, into American society uh, as a as a means of, of making money so that their children uh, could thrive uh, in this country and so um, you know many Kore many many South Korean people are very very proud uh, and so I think for them. Um, for them, it was important to reopen, but for me, I don't think I would. Okay. Uh, I, I think you covered uh, all the bases on this one. Uh, I think some people reopen. Obviously, the majority did reopen. But the way I look at it, on not reopening, uh, I think a lot of uh, not just Korean store owners, but small business owners in general, they put a lot into their business. In other words, my parents used to have a Chinese restaurant, a small restaurant in Selma. And so one time I just added up the hours that they worked in an average week. And uh, Michael, guess how many hours is that in a week? You mean each of your parents? Uh, or so they were combined? Parents in an in a average work week. Yeah, rounded off in tens. Uh, oh God, I mean, it, it had to be so seven. It, probably a hundred hours each. No, no, it's only 70. 
<laughs> it's only 70. So, but if we look at 70, this would be, and all we're shooting for is like 40 hours a week. So it'd be like 30 extra hours. And some people work more than 70. And so the way I look at it for these store owners, if they put their heart and soul into it and it's really damaged, you're worried about it happening again. Uh, another way of looking at it, if uh, if a person puts a lot into their marriage and it ends up being a very bad marriage, that person is going to be very leery or scared into getting married again. That's how I see it. Uh, next slide, please. I'll, you know, I'll add a, a, a small piece um, from my own, my own history, uh, well, my, my family's history. Um, my... Uh, my family had uh, a restaurant in um, in Tulare uh, before the war. Uh, it, it was it was a um, a well loved restaurant in Tulare, and uh, but then after the bombing of Pearl Harbor and a lot of the subsequent um, anti Japanese sentiment around that time, um, you know, my family was obviously forced. Uh, into relocation camps. Uh, first, you know, coming to the Fresno Assembly Center uh, on the, the, the Fresno Fairgrounds, where the Fresno Fairgrounds is now. Um, you know, my family, they lost their, their restaurant uh, in Tulare. Um, and, you know, I, I, when I asked my grandma, uh, you know, I said, did, did your dad and your mom, did they ever think about going back to Tulare and reopening that restaurant? Um, you know, for them, for them, when when the community of Tulare turned on them, uh, when the community of Tulare, you know, took the restaurant. Uh, it, speaking of looting, I mean, they 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 waited for my family to have to leave, and they just took everything uh, from that restaurant. Took everything from their home uh, that they had to leave, but all their belongings. That was it. That was that that break uh, with that community, and uh, my family was never able to uh, to even, even consider going back uh, to to that community uh, that turned on them and hated them so much. Yeah. Um, I think you gave a very like a real life experience based on that. Let's sit right in. Uh, go ahead, Michael. You talk about 9-11. Yes. So, gosh. Um, I mean, every, everyone definitely remembers uh, the attacks of September 11th. Um, but right here we have an example. And uh, I'll, I'll bring in another example later uh, that, that brings it a little closer to home. But um, we have this, this guy, Frank Silva Roque, um, and who told his friends right, that he was going to go shoot some towel heads. Um, as, as all of us know, though, right, um, uh, Sikhs, right, people who are Sikh, uh, have no relationship at all to, or, or, and no, no uh, cultural association I mean, not even a not even a hint of an association to um, to to the men uh, and or even you know to the religion uh, that many people associated with uh, the terrorists who are who were guilty of the attacks of September 11th. Um, this poor man, and I, I mean, I you know some of you probably remember even this happening. I remember it was so horrific. Um, uh, Balbir Singh Sodhi, right, who, who was a taxi driver, uh, had enough money, saved up enough money, right, uh, was able to buy a gas station. Um, and then you have this guy, Frank Roque, um, who shot the Sikh man because he wanted to go shoot some towel heads. So. Terrific. Oh. Okay. Uh, let, let me address the last two questions then, since you covered it. Okay. Uh, 
doesn't matter what the religion was or is. Um, I don't think necessary it does. If if the religion is is not what most people feel the right religion in America, Christianity, uh, that's all that matters. It's a different religion. Uh, they're not really going to distinguish uh, whether a person is from India, whether it's from Sikh or Muslim, because India was ruled by the Mughals for a few hundred years and they were Muslim, but uh, Sikhs are not Muslims. But I don't think it would really have made a difference uh, and so forth. And that sets up uh, why are Asians the victims of violence? Uh, basically, I sort of feel they feel Asians are easy targets. Uh, nothing's going to happen. Uh, let me take my revenge or whatever. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, just real quick, uh, and again, I, I mean, I think that, that it, it's this is probably a case that it hits home for a lot of us. Um, but, you know, I, I remember, I think it was in 2015, uh, when, when a Fresno City College student, uh, when actually, I think it was two Fresno City College students, um, when they saw an, an elderly Sikh man in the morning who was on his way to work, and they beat him, and then ran him over with their car. But and these were two Fresno City College students, and this was, like I said, maybe 2015. Um, and then I think it was probably 2016 when when one of the one of the um, one of the perpetrators was convicted, um, and the other the other perpetrator, the one who was driving the car, who ran intentionally ran over that Sikh man uh, because they thought that he was a terrorist, uh, or they associated him with terrorism. Um, one of them committed suicide. Uh, you know most likely right because of uh because of the just how horrifying uh it was um what they did to that poor Sikh man right and this was you know these are fresno city college students right this is you know for us this is why it's so important what we do it's so important to have these conversations it's so important right to be able to talk about these things um because that's that's right in our own backyard So, you know, again, yep, John. Can, can we watch the video before you talk about it? On G. And the moment a grandfather, grandfather killed in a brazen attack, attack. Now, now the victim's family calling for justice. Good, Good evening, Elizabeth. I'm Alan Martin. That, that attack, attack happened in broad daylight, daylight in San Francisco. Francisco. As Ken Bastida reports, the victim's family wants the suspect held accountable and also calling for an end to racism. That's right, Alan. The victim's, right, Alan. Alan, the victim's family rightfully upset. Uh, we'll hear from them. But first, we have disturbing new surveillance video of this crime. It shows a complete disregard for human life. and. This video you're about to see may be difficult for some to watch. It's been a, a total shock. I can't believe it that happened to him. Yes. He's a good man, yeah. He's a good guy. A daughter and son-in-law in mourning after Visha Ratanapakti died in a horrifying attack. The surveillance video captures the moment of impact. You can see Ratanapakti in the driveway. A suspect barrels him down and takes off, leaving the victim lifeless on the ground. Seeing the video is just devastating. It's, it hurts so much. The incident happened on Thursday on Fortuna Avenue in the Anza Vista neighborhood. Ratana Pakti died from his injuries on Saturday. San Francisco police say a 19-year-old suspect has been arrested. The victim's family is now demanding justice. This guy should not be let up back on the street. He should be charged with, with murder. If you see the video, there's, it's, there's nothing non-intentional about it. The family says Ratana Pakti came to San Francisco from Thailand to help raise his grandchildren. They believe that racism played a role in the attack. On a family organized GoFundMe page to raise money for funeral arrangements. They say that racism has once again proven deadly. When people saw me, because of what I'm looking like, I'm Asian, you know, and then they, they frame me as a, I bring the COVID to this country. 
The family, now hopeful for change, is remembering Ratana Pakti as a calm, gentle man who always put family first. He came uh, to stay with us to help, help us with our children. We took care of him, but he also took care of us. Now, police arrested Antoine Watson. He lives in Daly City. He has been booked on one count of murder. A female associate as well, Malaysia Gu, she has also been arrested. Uh, go ahead, Michael. You, you can talk about this case first, and then, then I'll talk about it. I, I mean, for me, this is very hard to talk about. Um, and a lot of it, be, you know, is because this is, it's one of the first times in my life um, when when I've had to live in fear uh, and, you know, less, less for myself, uh, but more for my family. Um, you know, when I remember around the time when, when this, when this happened, I was, you know, thinking so much about my, about my mom every day. Um, and, you know, my, a lot of elderly family members that I have, right. And thinking that this was just a Thai man, 84 year old Thai man walking on this, on, on the sidewalk near his house when someone did that to him. Right. And obviously this was not the only case, Right, there were so many, so many uh, cases of this happening. And every day I was afraid, right? Every day I was afraid that, uh, that someone I loved, someone in my family uh, was going to be attacked just because they were Asian. And it's a, it's a, it's a really, really horrible feeling. Okay. Um, let me, let me talk then since you presented that, um, basically, uh, when I was putting together this PowerPoint, uh, this was a case that, uh, happened last year, uh, Michael and myself were part of the Asian American faculty staff association. And, uh, we did a presentation and I think part of the motivation for this presentation, uh, that we did last spring, uh, Susie helped us, Nitsa helped us, uh, was because of the, the rash of anti-Asian violence. Uh, the two key cases were the one with uh, the Thai grandfather here and, and the slashing of uh, uh, the Burmese man and his child in the, in the next slide. Um, when I think about this case and I looked at it, uh, news that came up was uh, Anton Watson is uh, African American. Uh, he had, I guess, uh, his grandmother uh, was questioned on uh, what kind of sentence uh, would she hope for uh, her grandson. And I think uh, the grandmother was pretty uh, straightforward, honest. Uh, she hoped uh, that we would be acquitted. Uh, that's what she said. And, and I think uh, a lot of grandparents would feel the same way. Uh, my take on on the case is kind of different um i think uh anton watson uh bum rushed or tackled or pushed uh each uh to the ground i don't know if he really had the intent that he would be dead you know what i mean uh how i see him after he had shoved the Thai grandfather to the ground as he's walking away is, it's almost like he's proud. There's a swagger when he's moving. I knocked the guy down. Uh, why did he knock him down? Uh, think back uh, last year, uh, we're all in the throes of the, the pandemic, uh, COVID. Uh, you guys know that the former president uh, referred to as the China virus, the Kung flu. I, mean, I think it fueled a lot of uh, anger that people had. Uh, think about the theme about the blame the Asians for this, you know, uh, so far. Um, 
if that had been my grandchild, grandson, I would want him to go to jail. I think he should serve 10 to 20 years, minimally 10 years, maybe max 20 years. Uh, intent was maybe not to kill. And I would apologize to the family. Uh, I'm sorry that my grandson killed your father, your children's grandfather. You know, it's the wrong thing to do. Uh, people should see uh, Asian people as the same as themselves type of thing. So that would be uh, my interpretation. Uh, with charges filed, uh, I didn't know uh, the difference between murder and so forth. But what I was reading is that like, the person could be charged for murder, even though the intent was not to kill. So in that case, um, yeah, charge him for murder. Uh, I'm not sure what the sentence would be, but you know, take 20 years away. The guy will get out when he's 40s. Okay. The person killed will never come back. Uh, there's a big difference. Uh, Michael mentioned fear for his mother or so forth. For me personally, when I hear about these, and I was looking at cases, I didn't even want to read about more cases about a person being shoved in front of a subway. For me, emotionally, it's really more anger, more anger than fear. So next slide, please. Go ahead, Michael. So, uh, yes. So this was this was that picture that we saw right from the from the opening slide. Um, again, I, you know, I think that that many of you probably uh, remember when this happened. Um, we have uh, a, a Burmese man and his children at a Sam's Club. Uh, it was in Texas. I if, it doesn't say here, but I I seem to remember it being in Texas. Um, and they were at Sam's Club, right? Just for the reason that, that anybody would go to Sam's Club. And uh, Jose Gomez, uh, I, I, if I remember right, it was with a, uh, it was with a, a box opener, or, or they were, you know, like a, um, and. Uh, at the Sam's Club, and was swiping at um, at the man and his and his sons, and you know you saw from that earlier picture uh, just cut them severely across their faces. And as you see now, he was uh, punished uh, and is is facing uh, a maximum sentence of life imprisonment, which he should. Um, okay, uh, this one, uh, in this case, uh, he pleaded guilty, so the sentence. Uh, let me address the last question. How much responsibility should Donald Trump bear for his crime? Uh, you know that Donald Trump would say, hey, I didn't cut anybody's face or something along that line. The, the problem look at E, get out of America. Isn't that a theme from early on that Asian people are the perpetual foreigner? They're going to be seen as uh, not belonging here. Uh, for me, this is a really horrendous crime. It's hard to imagine that anybody would take a knife to a kid. That's just so far out, uh, but I guess we have enough sick people or mentally ill people can take what any demagogue points to a group. These people are causing 
problems for us. And they're not going to say, oh, I didn't tell them to do that. But so would anything really accrue to Donald Trump? Uh, legally, probably no, not. But I think people should be careful what they say. Next slide. Uh, go ahead, Michael. Uh, I, I think you could read all of these. Right. So, so the future, right? What can we do uh, to better to better the future? Um, I mean, so many of these seem so obvious, and it's so it's it's, it's so shocking and disheartening that. that that you even have to say them out loud, right? But um, the first one, stop blaming Asians. Or, I mean, and, and you know, moving into the future, even beyond Asians, stop blaming any group, um, right, for the actions of, uh, of others, right? I mean, we see so many cases, uh, whether it's, you know, Vincent Chin, right, a Chinese, uh, a Chinese man that's 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 killed for the actions of uh, of Japanese, right? Or we see uh, we see a, a Thai man in in this last case, right? A Thai man and a Burmese man, right? That are killed for the um, or not killed or or maimed um, for the perceived uh, the perceived actions of uh, of Chinese. Um, or the Sikh man uh, who was killed, or in the case of, you know, here in Fresno, the Sikh man who was beaten and run over um, because they were terrorists. Um, also, realize that everyone uh, is the same, uh, right? We, we know that, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, as you've been going through these, I'm sure it's been said before, right? But we know that uh, the race is a social construct. And if race is a social construct, then it means that we all are the same. Whether or not we, we want to admit it, whether or not we realize it, we are the same. We have to make sure that uh, the perpetrators of violence uh, are punished. Right? I mean, we. We don't have to look, you know, that much further than um, than some of the recent cases, right? Particularly um, uh, with Kyle Rittenhouse, right? Fairly recently, um, seeing how how oftentimes, right, people aren't adequately punished uh, for violence, aren't adequately punished for their their crimes. This is a big one now, right? As as uh, Elon Musk buys Twitter uh, and promises to just open up Twitter uh, wide to everyone uh, and not to limit Twitter. Um, this idea of restricting social media posts that incite violence uh, or that are in, incendiary and um, and promote uh, unlawful behavior. One of the most important things, right, is we have to speak up. Right? When we see acts of violence, when we see acts of racism, when we see acts of microaggressions, uh, we have to speak up. Right? It's one of the reasons why 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 these things are allowed to happen. It's one of these things why you know reasons why racism um, festers in our society. Right? Because uh, because we don't speak up, we don't use uh, we don't use our voices uh, when we see others um, who are being attacked. Uh, follow the golden rule, right? It's super simple. Uh, I have no idea what the negative golden rule is. So John can talk about the negative golden rule in a second. Uh, fight back if you need to, right? It's, it's again one of these things that, um, and it's okay to fight back. Right, uh, you know, particularly for Asians, right? Often when I think about it, right, we're, we're Asians are, are have, have 
perceived to be, are stereotyped to be uh, people who won't fight back, but we have to fight back, right? And it doesn't matter how people perceive us when we fight back, right? As being angry or uh, as being jealous or whatever it is, right? We have to fight back um, when we need to. So John, what is the negative golden rule? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Uh, the negative golden rule is associated with uh, Confucius. And basically the golden rule uh, connected with Christianity, uh, treat other people how you want to be treated. The negative golden rule says, don't treat other people how you don't want to be treated. So it becomes really a more restraint or restriction on your behavior towards other people. Uh, I should not insult you, uh, hit you, because I don't want you to insult or hit me. So it's a restraint on your behavior. Good enough? OK. Uh, to, to summarize or to, to add on to this, uh, actually, I, uh, I had another thought on the Anton Watson case, uh, why I feel bad about the case, is that nobody represents anybody else. They only represent themselves. So I think for the media to see Anton Watson as African-American is very unfair for all the, the hardworking, uh, follow the straight line African-Americans who are trying to do their best in our society and so forth to be connected. Uh, he does not represent anybody except Antoine Watson. So that's one thought I have. Uh, going back to what can we do better for the future? Uh, Michael read it already. Uh, I really feel that uh, everybody should see that we're all the same, regardless of whether you're white, black, Asian, Latino, fat, skinny, rich, poor, good looking, ugly, straight, gay. You like one team or another team in sports. We're all the same. We all have a humanity about us. We all want other people to respect us, to give us dignity. So we should all treat other people the same. We should not blame anybody or any group. Uh, I think one thing I uh, spoke out at the anti-racism panel discussion, uh, I think it was like last week or so, is, uh, is that uh, we are all the same. Uh, don't think you're different. Uh, other people want the same treatment, you know. Uh, we're not asking for anything special. And so when I look at anti-Asian violence, uh, my immediate reaction is really uh, angry or anger. Uh, why should people dump on Asians? Why should they dump on anybody? You know, uh, we should not be blamed for this, blamed for that, or targeted, and so forth. Uh, I'm really grateful. Uh, and I think I speak for Michael as well as myself, uh, that we're allowed uh, to present, to share our thoughts, to share our feelings. And for the people that uh, attend or watch, uh, we're all in the same boat. We should all respect each other. That's, that's my comment. And so anything else you want to add, Michael? No, and it's, you know, it, uh, again, um, it, it, part of it gets back to, um, to one of the earlier slides, one of the first slides uh, in thinking about, um, uh, in thinking about Asians uh, and that model minority myth uh, that you mentioned, right? Uh, I think that it's, it's really easy for, for people to, to think about Asians, to look at Asians as though uh, as though Asians are doing well, as though Asians are um, uh, succeeding, uh, I guess in a way, or, but in reality, uh, there are many, uh, many of our Asian groups that aren't uh, as successful or that, that, uh, that are, are still very much uh, living in poverty and need as much help uh, as any other group 
Um, you know, so to, to John's point, right, it's important to, to, to think about people as individuals uh, and to really have that understanding of, um, of, of what people need and that, and that not everyone is the same. Because it, it it can very negatively that that type of thinking can very negatively impact uh, a lot of our students, particularly uh, a lot of our Southeast Asian students. Okay, uh, I would add to that that uh, Michael was talking about disaggregating. Uh, people can look at whatever statistics they want. Uh, they could lump Asians and say, "Well, they're doing well," uh, but even in uh, specific. Uh, ethnic group, uh, there's quite a bit of contrast. Uh, for example, if they look at Chinese Americans, they say, oh, their medium income is pretty high, but they have a higher percentage in poverty than the American average as well. So it doesn't mean everybody's doing well, to, to add on to, to what you said. Um, so kind of like with that, I think that kind of like concludes our uh, presentation, but uh, we could address questions. So. Uh, I'm not sure what the questions are or if there are any. Are there any questions? Thank you, John. Um, no, we don't have any questions that have come in yet, um, but we did get just a um, comment from one of our participants today, and it just says, John and Michael, I can tell by your voices as you recount these attacks against Asian Americans how horrified and upset it makes you. It's horrifying to me as well. What can we do as classified professionals in the district to help? Okay. Yeah, Michael, you go first, and I go second. Um, right, it's, as, as classified professionals, um, as colleagues, right? Uh, this, this, I, I don't think about this in terms of, of positions, in terms of roles on campus. Um, as colleagues, as, as people who are part of a community, right, particularly here in, at, um, at Fresno City College or in State Center Community College District, right, we're a community. And so realistically, right, the most important thing that any of us can do is to support each other, to help each other, uh, and to be there for each other, to defend each other. And, and, and you know, like, like we were talking about before, to speak up, right? So it's so important when we're in spaces uh, when we see microaggressions, when we see acts of racism, whether they're whether they're overt um, uh, or they're you know a little bit covert, uh, it's so important uh, for us to speak up, to be advocates, um, and to to support each other. So thanks for that question. It's, it's I, I mean that's that's you know from my perspective, it's the most important thing we can do is to help one another, uh, just as as people. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would take that uh, comment as uh, uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, uh, it shows that you recognize that uh, Michael, myself, uh, being members of the Asian American community, uh, uh, do want uh, support from uh, others as well uh, in terms of this issue. I think we as individuals can really only uh, affect uh, how we think, uh, feel, share some of the thoughts with those people around us. And and I think just a sense of uh, support that we get from other people uh, on our campus is it's good. Uh, I uh, so thank you for that. And then we did have one more question come in referring to one of the earlier slides that you had. Who is or was George S. Craig? George S. Craig. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, this was from the, the Snake River uh, Massacre. Uh, I'm assuming that George S. Craig might have been on the jury himself. Okay or a newspaper reporter. And so by that statement, it is saying basically, hey, uh, the jury didn't really care. Uh, they were just uh, a group of Chinamen. Uh, who cares if they're dead or not type of thing, you know? So I would figure George S. Craig 
would have been on the jury or just observer a journalist. Okay, thank you. And then we have a few minutes left. I don't know if there's anything else that you either of you would like to add before we end this session, John or Michael. Go, Michael, you go first. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. Very good. I don't, are you muted? I don't, I don't hear you, Michael. Andrea, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me now? Yeah. So the, um, what I'd, I'd like to say is just my, my heartfelt appreciation um, to all the classified professionals who are here, um, to classified Senate, uh, for arranging this uh, and this, this set of seminars throughout the semester. Um, what you're doing is so, so, so important. Uh, and, you know, it, 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 it makes me feel great, um, you know, to know that, uh, that I, I work um, uh, in a space and, and for a community uh, who really, really cares and gets it, right? This is, it, it's hard stuff, right? This is, this is really difficult uh, to talk about. Uh, it's difficult, I think, to hear sometimes, depending on, on um, what the topic is. But I wanna, I wanna thank everyone involved and, and everyone here, because this is, this is how we get better, right? This is, to, to John, one of John's earlier um, uh, slides, this is how we get better. Where we get better by talking about it, we get better by learning. Uh, and we get better by sharing and, and discussing. So uh, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and then one last thing uh, before John closes us out. Um, Andrea mentioned that tomorrow is Asian Fest, which is obviously uh, true. Um, and at Asian Fest tomorrow, we, um, we are going to have kind of a new feature. Uh, and right outside of the cafeteria, we're having a, a beer and sake garden. All of the proceeds are going to student scholarships. Uh, so, you know, come on out and uh, have a good time. Again, I, you know, I would say it's a, uh, it's a, it's a win-win, right? When you can, when you can buy beer uh, and enjoy beer and uh, support students at the same time. Uh, but uh, another thing is that, and right when we finish, I have to go run over because uh, we're actually starting our night market. So tonight uh, until nine o'clock, uh, if you come out to the Asian Fest area, right, the, the free speech area, uh, we're also going to be running the sake and beer garden tonight as well. There's going to be some live entertainment uh, and a sushi truck and a, and a uh, taco truck as well. Um, so come out and have some, some fun and uh, drink a few beers for our students. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm buying Michael a beer at five, so how are you beer at five, Michael? Um, I, I think Michael said pretty much what, uh, my thoughts were, uh, I, I, I'd like to thank, uh, everybody, uh, involved on the classified Senate, uh, give us a chance to, to speak up, uh, to share, uh, thoughts and opinions we have. Uh, I'll just go back to the core. Uh, it, it feels really kind of like, uh, very great uh, and, and I think I speak for Michael as well as myself to, to feel that we're supported uh, to feel that uh, people uh, in the classified Senate uh, uh, want to hear what we have to say and again uh, we're all part of uh, the campus uh, we all want to do our share uh, I think we as individuals uh, all of us uh, want to produce a, a better community uh, a better society, uh, which is uh, less racist, uh, less uh, racial hatred, that we move towards uh, a future uh, where people can uh, feel uh, they could be whatever their ethnicity, uh, whatever their race, and it's, it's not detrimental. They don't have to be somebody else uh, for us to accept our identity. So. Um, 
uh, I think that's important. So uh, I just leave it at that. So, uh, thank you very much. Well said. Thank you, John and Michael. There is room for all of us. There are resources for all of us. And let's all just uh, work hard to do better. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time today. Thank you for your classified professionals for joining us. Enjoy your the rest of your 30 minutes till 5 o'clock. And then have a great weekend. And um, just stay tuned for any upcoming sem seminars that we may have. Um, and check out our YouTube as well. So you can watch any um, past presentations that we've had. Take care, thank everyone. You.